the worst kind of suffering is actually loneliness. And they said that loneliness can hurt a person at the same level that smoking 15 cigarettes a day can. And I think there's a difference between dealing with the challenges of life by yourself versus having people to walk alongside you. Welcome to Unlikely Gifts, a podcast for anyone looking for hope amid difficult circumstances. Life can be beautiful, unexpected, and at times profoundly difficult. It helps to hear from others who have grown from life's challenges and joys. That's why Leonard Imbanani and Cynthia Bauer are sharing how their experiences working with families impacted by disabilities in Africa have taught them about life's most amazing gifts and its hardest tragedies. These are Unlikely Gifts. Hello and welcome back to Unlikely Gifts. I'm Frank Boswell and I'm joined by Cynthia Bauer and Leonard Imbanani, the co-founders and directors of an organization called Capenda for the Children. Capenda is a Swahili word for love and the organization exists to replace harmful beliefs surrounding disability with beliefs that improve lives. Hello, Leonard and Cindy. Our listeners might be interested in to know this is Christmas season, and that's a wonderful thing. Now, I know in our context, Christmas is also uh, a difficult time emotionally. A lot of people, any uh, sorrows or hurts or difficulties that they're dealing with are magnified and they're intensified at this time of year. And so maybe our topic today is a little bit timely because we wanted to talk about suffering. And uh, given the kind of work that you're involved in, you would know uh, a lot about that. Do you, I wonder if I could just ask you, not so much for detail, but just, just outline again for our listeners, what kind of suffering do you deal with on a daily basis in your work? Okay, thank you so much for that uh, question. It's like uh, a summer of what we go through on daily basis. Uh, indeed, with our work, we witness a lot of suffering starting with the, uh, the children themselves. Uh, many times you come across a child who has cerebral palsy and you can see how this child is really, really struggling. Uh, maybe with the daily living act activities, it's also it's a big struggle. Sometimes you come across children who maybe are always in uh, the hospital going through a lot of suffering. Others, you find that uh, maybe they had a fracture or they have been having several fractures. They are in pain also. Others, it's not pain because of the disability, but it's pain because of the insults they are getting from uh, friends and uh, people around him or her. But uh, worse enough is that when you see a child with a terminal illness, let's say like a muscular dystrophy, you find talking about bread that there's no cure for this disease or for this condition. And here's a child going through all those stages. You really feel what this child is going through. So indeed, in our work, we have been observing a lot, a lot of suffering to a point that you feel like you are carrying that burden of all the children you have seen who are going through a lot of suffering. It is not only to the children and even to the parents. You see a parent sharing her experiences and even shedding tears. Some are sharing experiences that are unbelievable, but they have gone through those uh, experiences just because suffering because of having a child with a disability. Yes. So do you feel would... like when you're over there? What do you do? What do you um, see? I would. I mean, I have seen. Uh, there's a few special cases where I have come, I've been there because they were special cases, like obviously sexual abuse cases um, are really hard. When I've been at funerals of children, that's also really hard. But honestly, I think I heard it uh, at a conference recently when someone said the worst kind of suffering um, is actually loneliness. And uh, they said that loneliness can hurt a person at the same level that smoking 15 cigarettes a day can. It has that same kind of effect on you and your overall physical health. And so many of our kids and families are really just not connected to community. And I think that 
that is a really hard kind of separate. And even when we talk about um, kids that I've got, I got to meet a few kids who had muscular dystrophy, and that's hard because they know that there is no, there's, there, it's a death sentence. They will only get worse over time. Um, I think that there's something to, in that progress, even in that, or the opposite of progress, really, um, they're actually, when they're not alone, that makes such a difference. And I think there's a difference between dealing with the challenges of life by yourself versus having people to walk alongside you. And I think when they're left alone, I think there's a few, there's a story of a little girl that often haunts me um, who has cerebral palsy. She couldn't really walk on her own and she died of dehydration um, and because someone left her in the sun and she wasn't able to move from there. And just the whole thought of her just being left there by herself and, and, and experiencing the end of her life compared to, say, um, my niece who we lost just uh, less than two years ago now who was with her parents the whole time and just thinking about even in that suffering, having other people with you, what a difference that makes. So I think loneliness is the one that always really gets me, kids who are left alone. So there's the physical suffering that the child experiences. And I, I don't know, it's just universal, isn't it? That when it's a child that's suffering, it, it just it just seems worse. So there is, there's a kind of a suffering, isn't there, for the people that are around them? Mm -hmm. uh, watching this and feeling helpless, I guess, I don't know. Well, and I think the suffering of a child is also, especially if that suffering ends in death, it's so unnatural to us because that's not supposed to be. And we've seen the suffering of parents who've lost their children. And I think that's also just one of the hardest things that people can imagine having to go through. Hmm. And then there are the attitudes towards the suffering and uh, I mean, the, the the child could be left to themselves. I don't know. That's really disturbing. Well, are, are there before I move on? Are there differences in? Uh, I mean, I know our cultures are very different. Are there? What are the what are the cultural differences and attitudes towards suffering, if any, between North America and Africa? I'll start with one that's been my ob observation, having gone back and forth a lot. I think one of the things with suffering in America is we're always seem to be surprised by it as if suffering's not supposed to happen because we have this idealized version of what life is supposed to be. Whereas in Kenya, my experience has been, I don't know that they're surprised by it. Let me be, I think that they, they experience a lot more suffering on a regular basis. I've heard someone say, he's like, well, that's what's part of being African. I mean, we can get into some of the theological uh, questions around suffering as well, but Leonard, would you say that that's true? I feel like in America, people are surprised by it. We expect to be comfortable, where I don't think that expectation exists in Kenya. Uh, you are right, Cindy, just because uh, Kenyans have gone through a lot of suffering. They have seen so many of these children suffer. They have even seen other people, not necessarily with disabilities, but also still suffer. It's so common that they have become used to it. So as much as it might appear strange, but we are used to it. This family in my neighborhood is suffering. They have a sick person. The other family has a child who is having a disability. So it's so common. And I think we are reaching to a point where if things are not going to change, it's like suffering will be seen like in other as a, as a normal thing, which I think is not the best thing to, uh, to uh, look at it. But because there's too much suffering, it's like, what do we do? We have to accept it. It's like someone living in a jail throughout his life. He gets used to that life of suffering in a jail and feels that he's at home while he's in jail. And I think many Kenyans are suffering, but that is the way of life. That is how things are on daily basis. So they get used to suffering. Yeah, and we don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to not know where my next meal is coming from. I don't know what it's like to not be able to get enough water. I don't know what it's like to have to walk a few miles to even get the basic water that I need, which is true in many of the rural communities we work with. And it's true for so much of the population around the world. I had a, 
a story of a when my mom was talking about one of her friends she ran into in the grocery store no, i was in the grocery store with them actually and she i had just come back from a trip to kenya or uganda or something like that and this woman said yeah my um sister went to the peace corps in some place in africa and when she came back to the united states she couldn't deal with the normal world she said normal in quotation i say quotation and I was sitting in the aisle of a grocery store in America. And I was like, so you think this is the real world, like the grocery store? Because the thing is, like, Leonard and everyone I have ever met in Kenya, Sierra Leone, anywhere, they all farm. They all have a direct relationship to the land. They know what happens when it doesn't rain. For us, I can still get the same bananas I always get when I go to the grocery store. And I think that that's where we have this altered reality. We're buffered from so much of the things that go wrong in the world in our American context. Wait, it it needs to rain to have bananas? <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me that in uh, in our cultural context with North America, we we actively hide suffering and we cosmetize it and we just keep it out of sight as much as possible, and. Uh, I guess I'm wondering well, why and nobody likes suffering, but we almost have the luxury of trying to ignore it. And I guess what we're really ignoring are some of the questions that it, it thrusts upon us. I mean, it, it, it's profoundly disturbing and uh, not easy to answer. And I know you all have said that it's not just the disability that causes suffering, but it's people's perceptions of uh, people that have disabilities that causes suffering. And I wonder, what, what does that look like in North America? What does that look like in Kenya? I have had the same theological and philosophical debates around suffering in Kenya and Sierra Leone and other African countries as I have in the United States, interestingly enough. Hmm. Um, I think that some of the similarities came about more when my own family was experiencing an extreme level of suffering going through my niece having cancer and losing her at nine years old. I think that the same questions came about from my brother, who was a pastor that we were having, because my brother actually even said it once. He was quoting another pastor who said, the worst kind of suffering is the kind that happens to you. That's when you have those questions. Like, and I think, Leonard, you could maybe expand on that a little bit, too, because we've been having discussions with pastors and other community leaders about suffering and why and why does God allow it or why does suffering happen, all these different things. But then when Leonard got cancer, I re what, what happened then, Leonard? Oh, uh, when I was diagnosed with cancer, for sure, like another human being. I had a number of questions I asking to myself, why me? What is it that I did wrong that I'm getting this uh, kind of uh, a sickness? And uh, it was not easy uh, to just come to terms with it. Uh, but I really understood one thing that uh, if I'm not strong, there were so many things that I did have gone wrong. Because what would have uh, been shared with my family members would have been thinking of going to the, uh, uh, the herbalist for treatment. So I would imagine to, too much of the resources would have been spent on the, the herbalist. And again, they would maybe have gone to the sweet soothsayer where they would get a lot of wrong information, which would have caused a lot of friction within family members blaming one another that Leonard's sickness is not God's uh, plan, but somebody is behind it. And then at times it's either a neighbor according to the soothsayers or our relatives. For, so for me, what I did, I uh, was to bring on board my close uh, relatives and tell them this is not the way, the direction to go. Thinking of uh, the med uh, the traditional treatment is a medical condition and I have to go the medical way. Indeed, it was full of suffering. Uh, even when you are just coming from a surgery, the pain you are going through, uh, the chemo that you are going to I remember there was a time, even my own relatives, my own people who are very near me, were told to be a little bit away because of the type of chemo, which was very 
uh, please them as you can leave that fake the jaws around me. And it was like, oh, what is this? And uh, I remember even crying at one point because of the effects of chemo and so on. But yes, suffering, even if you are seeing suffering from another person, you may not really understand it, but let it happen to you or to your very close friend or relative. That is when you know what it means uh, to suffer. And I think that was uh, a good experience for me to know what suffering is. And I could even relate it to what my, the children we are serv serving and the families I learn through. Wow. Well, maybe that touches on the question of uh, people's assumptions and religious beliefs that Cindy alluded to. Uh, how, how do people view suffering? I guess, philosophically or theologically in Kenya. And uh, I don't know if there's a corresponding answer to that in North America from your perceptive, uh, perspective, Cindy, because you, you crossed the borders there. I'll just say, I'll let Leonard answer yeah. for Kenya, but I would say there's more similarities than differences the longer I do this. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But Leonard, you want to answer that question? First. Yes, uh, suffering in our communities is there and it will still remain to be in the communities. But there is different types of suffering. Like when you miss food, people will say, oh, this is something normal. When you are sick, like having malaria for three days and so, so yes, you are suffering. But they believe that this is something normal, which is just going to last for a short time. However, when it comes to a serious suffering, let's say like the way I've mentioned of children with muscular dystrophy, children with terminal conditions, including cancer, people will not perceive it as a natural suffering. They will always say there must be something behind this suffering. Why should so and so suffer throughout his life? Why should he have suffered for all those many, many years? No, there is something behind it. And now when they come to the reason, that's where the confusion is. Some are going to say it's witchcraft. Others are going to say maybe it's a curse. The body thinks that uh, this family or their parents did. That's why they are going through all these sufferings. And uh, it's fine like, okay, I'm already suffering, and instead of looking at me and how to support me, you are also blaming me. So suffering in our community will always depend on what level of suffering you are going through. Otherwise, it is on the extreme end, they will always connect it with something. Yeah, and I think that, you know, a lot of times people want to explain the suffering and in pe especially people on the outside, like that there must be a reason for it or something like that. And I think that when people do that, what I've seen um, is it makes the suffering worse when people are trying to give a reason for why you're suffering. Usually it's a blame on the person. Although I read a book um, a long time ago on you know, basically on suffering, because I've read a lot of books on that, given the work that we do. And it seems that people want to say, oh, well, you know, they could even go the opposite. Instead of saying, oh, this was in America, maybe not always saying, oh, you're being punished for something you did wrong, even though there are those people, um, for sure. There are others who would say, oh, this is to teach you a lesson to make because you're so strong. And you're like, if that's true, then I don't want to be strong. Like, or this is happening because you're such a good person that Satan is attacking you. And you're like, well, you know, a lot of the explanations, whether or not they are true, are not helpful. In the midst of suffering, I think that we've learned that the most we can do is just come along and be with people and sit with them. Because any time we try to, lock, I mean, people aren't in a place for those kinds of discussions. Or it's, it's one thing to talk about it just from a cerebral, logical place. But when people are in the midst of difficulty, and I know that you know this as a pastor, um, this, they just want you to be there, to listen, to let them say what they need to say, 
But when we start to judge them for not suffering the right way, that's where it becomes challenging, I think. And when I've seen some people, like my own family members, going through really difficult things and even blaming themselves sometimes for what's happening, like, well, what if? I had literally heard in the U.S., you know, people say, well, what if I had stronger faith? What if my faith was stronger than maybe maybe there, my daughter wouldn't have cancer or maybe this wouldn't happen? And so I've heard those same things on the U.S. side. I think that we just don't necessarily come alongside as many suffer. We don't experience as much of the suffering here so that maybe those questions are coming in the midst of it. But I think it's just this ongoing debate that people come around like, why suffering exists? What's the reason for it? And I think that sometimes those um, debates are unhelpful. And I said it at my own niece's um, service and her eulogy. I said, you know, when it comes to this kind of loss, when it comes to suffering, I don't think asking the question of why it's happening is actually very helpful. I think the question we need to ask ourselves in the midst of suffering is, okay, where do we go from here? What can we learn? How can we go forward? Because going backwards isn't really to me going to be very, it's, I have not found it to be a helpful conversation, but every time. Leonard and I have been with a family where we've lost, they've lost a child afterwards. Leonard and I will say, okay, what can we learn from this experience? How can we make this loss and the suffering not go to waste? And partly Kupenda exists partly because of that. You know, I had my own experiences growing up in the United States without a hand. And it is in terms of ability levels, it didn't really affect that. But in terms of society, it really connects me a lot to the kids that we work with and how people perceive me, things people would say, the own, my own insecurities, my own questions that I used to have. And so Kupenda is part of that, the reason that I was sensitive to the needs that I witnessed when I was in Kenya. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go backwards and say, well, this happened so. I would say this happened and, because I often say there's a bunch of one-armed people out there doing nothing. Like you just don't necessarily assume that suffering will result in something, but if we're suffering, we might as well not waste the pain. I think that was a quote I heard from somewhere somewhere else too. When you go through it, let's not waste it if we can help it. And I think Leonard definitely has put that to use too. Yeah, I've had conversations with God where I've said, "You better not waste this. I don't want this. I don't want any of this wasted." That's a uh... It's a pretty profound way of thinking. So I, I'm sitting here thinking how uh, it seems to me that uh, we, in, in our culture, want to outsource this to experts, and we want to distance ourselves from it as much as possible, whereas uh, you're talking about either situations where you can't escape it, or you're actually moving towards the suffering to be with the people that are suffering. And I would the question that's coming to my mind is, is what, what are we missing by not coming alongside and suffering with people? Does that make sense? Leonard, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it's making sense. Uh, let me start by saying what, you, what we are missing most is being uh, close to these people and uh, helping to meet their needs. Uh, sharing maybe even with the word of God with them. But in my experience in Kenya, and particularly with the pastors, as much as the pastors are doing things to support such families, but what comes out of their mouth is always more destroying. For example, if a pastor visits somebody who is suffering and they give some support and so on, they share the word of God, which is very good. But the part that I feel is more destroying is when they say, hey, it's because someone uh, within your family member, someone must have done something wrong to God, or maybe you have little faith and so on. So this is more destroying because you feel like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm suffering or someone is suffering because of his own fault. That becomes quite heavy for him. Otherwise, I think what we need to do as a a team is to meet their needs, either physically, socially, and so on. Even if it's mental, medical, we need to be there to serve them. And if we do that, I think that the suffering will not be as much as uh, we are expecting. For example, and I want to give a very live experience for my own. With all the suffering I've gone through as a result of cancer, 
I have always been having a very supportive family. My wife, my children have been very supportive. And everything that I needed, every support that I needed, they were there to support me. And even the larger family, that is my relatives, my uncles and whatever, were all there to support me. And I felt like, oh, I am not alone, even if I'm suffering. But there are people who are always with me. And I think that is very important to anybody who is going through suffering. Otherwise, if you put a blame, you are blaming that person. It's like you are really finishing that person. If you're already suffering, you are putting a, another suffering on top of whatever he's going through. Mm. And I think, too, what you were, what you were saying is going, going towards suffering, because that is kind of what we're doing in a way. I do think that there's something, uh, there's something at least very American. Leonard can speak to whether or not it's a Kenyan thing. Um, we want to shield people. We want to shield our children from it. We want to, I've had some people that don't want their children to know about certain things that are hard. Um, but honestly, I think that everyone's going to suffer at some point in their life. Um, not necessarily, it's not important to compare the kind of suffering, I guess. Suffering is your own suffering. But I have found that, and I've heard many people say, like, when you're suffering, probably one of the best ways to actually help yourself and the best healing for your own suffering is to come walk alongside someone else who's suffering and be there for them. Because I think that to be able to be present for someone, to be able to actually listen and give them the comfort they need in their, their worst times, let them scream, let them cry, or be silent, whatever they need at that time, it's actually something that can be healing for us to know that we're part of making a very difficult time maybe a little bit more bearable for them, to carry other people's burdens. I think it sounds strange, and people who haven't been there maybe don't understand it, somehow helps us with our own. Would you say that's true, Leonard? Yeah, that's true. And I will just remember my friend who was very close to me. This is Gerald and uh, he had muscular dystrophy. And I was there all the time, day and night, to support our Gerald, to support the family. Whenever they give a call and they need our assistance, we would be available. I would also find time to share uh, my time with him at his place for all that time until the last time he died. But I want to connect it with my suffering. Indeed, uh, he was a, somebody I would always refer to. When I'm in serious pain, I would always refer to this young man and say, hey, look at this young man, the suffering he went for all those many years because he began uh, to have muscular dystrophy, maybe at the age of eight, all through up to 23 years. And he has been suffering all that time. Non-stop, he's always suffering. What about me? I think he was really preparing me by being near to eat, serving me. It's like he was preparing me for whatever suffering I was likely to go through. So it was like a source of encouragement to me and say, hey, no. My friend has suffered and many children have suffered. They are still suffering. Suffering is part of me and I have to take it. So even when I was in this uh, hospital bed and I'm really going through a lot of suffering, I would remember two young men. I would remember Stephen, who is uh, always in a wheelchair. I would remember Gerald and it's like, no, I have to struggle. Suffering is there and suffering has to, we have to face suffering. So it really gave me a lot of encouragement and it's like, well, we have to suffer as you might have been. Well, and I think that when we, when we deal with um, this kind of suffering and have had been exposed to so many things, um, what other people are, are experiencing, when it does happen to us, one of the things I've found is, I know in America and I think in Kenya it also is true, uh, people ask, why me? And the answer is, well, why anyone? I don't think why that not? we, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, it, how can, we can't really, because I think that I talk with a lot of people in my family as well. Yeah. When my niece was diagnosed with a very challenging cancer, which ultimately took her life, 
I like, you know, when, as soon as she was diagnosed, the challenge was, and we'll talk about hope later, but the challenge was to be hopeful in her situation because I knew many children who had died and I did not believe that God loved my niece any more than the children we worked with. So it was a challenge in that. So there's a difference between being surprised by something because at first you don't really think about it logically that, oh, these things don't happen to us. But when it does happen, you're like, no, 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 wait, this isn't supposed to happen to us. This is something that happens to other people. And I have noticed like just even seeing like the changes in my own family when they, you know, go walking through with Ellie and Ellie, my niece taught us so much about suffering. Um, She's dancing in the hospital room with her IV with me and just showed us like how to have joy in the midst of very difficult things she was you know christmas time is really hard for our family right now because she just loved christmas like she did it all out everything she did was a celebration but i think that when we walk towards suffering we allow ourselves to experience when it does happen to us we know that it isn't unnatural we know that this is something that happens even though i do think sometimes we can think oh wait no 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 not us this isn't for us this doesn't happen to us and when you see it now and then when you're one of the ones suffering and you see people watching us and talking to us like oh wait no no like that's your thing i can't even imagine that happening to me and we're like well there's no reason that this couldn't happen to someone else like when i meet people who are younger who maybe haven't had a lot i always wonder i'm like what is going to be the challenge and how is that going to affect them when it happens? But I do think in some ways, the experiences we've had with the children in Africa, not necessarily, they, they just, they, they made it more so that we aren't surprised when it does happen to us because we know this is a reality of the world. And somehow knowing that others are suffering doesn't make your suffering go away, but it helps you to realize you're not the only one that's gone through it. Because sometimes I think we feel that way in our suffering. I think we often feel lonely, like we're the only ones, but that's not true. So it's kind of unlikely gift Mm -hmm. of enlisting of these stories. I mean, the last place most of us would expect to be encouraged is in the midst of all this awful stuff. And uh, and so it seems totally unlikely, and yet that's what you keep experiencing uh, as I listen to these stories. And with Gerald, actually, I want to add to the Gerald one for a moment. Um, when I got to visit him not too long before he passed away, and he passed away only a month or two before my niece passed away, um, he gave me this tiny little yellow rose that he had made with paper. And I keep that on my shelf in my room. And right above it is a painting of a yellow rose that a friend of mine here in the U.S., her son, who also had muscular dystrophy, had painted. And those two things are just reminded reminders of this beauty of creativity that these two young men had, knowing themselves that they both knew what their that their life was not going to be long, and yet they used that life well to make beauty. And I think that's such a testimony for what we can do with suffering. Well, that was my next question. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is really as profoundly mysterious as suffering is beauty. I don't think we give enough thought to it. Uh, and maybe this is just asking what you've kind of addressed already, but maybe you could focus it a little more. How do you see beauty come out of the suffering that you've seen? So you've talked about creativity and 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 even uh, artifacts of art, you know. But um, and you've talked about being encouraged in relationships. Are there other things that you think of as beautiful? I mean, I think that some of the most compassionate people I've ever known are those who've experienced great suffering. Even watching, my brother has always been an amazing person, realizing he'll probably listen to this too. But when he lost his daughter, before um, she passed, he was reading the scriptures and highlighting all the sections on healing, 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 healing. And we'll probably bring that up more when we talk about healing. But after she passed, he got a new Bible. And... He said, I don't know why I didn't see it before, but the Bible is full of suffering and and kind of had to, and it's just like how he was seeing things. And I think that, I think for all of you who work with people, people in the ministry, I think it just makes people a little more sensitive, a more compassionate person when it comes to these other people. I had heard a pastor once say, who had to retire because of Parkinson's disease. He said, I hate Parkinson. He's like, but it has made me 
be more sensitive to other people who are sick. It's helped me to understand you can actually say, I've experienced suffering too. No suffering is the same, but I do know what it's like to question God and why is this happening? Know how to make weird deals with God. I've made like really strange deals with God about like all these different things. If you just do this and let my, I actually even specifically asked for my niece to live to 40. If you could just let her live to 40, that would be good. I just let her be a grown up, you know? And I think that it's helped me in the last couple of years even to relate more to our families on the ground in African countries to see like the reason they go to traditional healers is because they're desperate. And I've seen people here in the U.S., even in my own family, go to faith healers because they're desperate. When you think you're they're going to lose your child or the disability that they have just feels like it's going to hurt their life too much, you're going to do whatever it takes to save that kid. And I think I've seen that, you know, personally. So it really brings up beauty in people in some way. It, it changes who they are. Yeah. Any other things that come to mind, Leonard? Yeah, I think uh, suffering uh, has a lot of beauty in it. And imagining what has uh, changed in me. Uh, one, it has made me to understand children with disabilities more than I used to understand it. Because that element of suffering may not have been much understood by me until when I went through suffering. Then I could now relate it to the suffering that these children are also going through. And in that way, I have now become so much growth associated with these children uh, because I have learned what it means to be suffering. I have a lot of, I'm more compassionate to these children. Like I remember recently when uh, one of the children was brought into our office, he had problems with, his, with her eyes. We supported that child, we went to Mombasa and was diagnosed with the cancer. And he is now currently going through chemo. And I've made sure that he does not miss money for every session that is needed. And I'm seeing like, oh, here I am. I have to support this child and I have to support. He has a life to live. And if I'm there, why can't I uh, really support this child? So it has made me travel a lot of compassion, as I'll say. It has also given me uh, a better understanding of these children. So there is also beauty in suffering. Well, I heard a, a quote from George MacDonald that uh, really hit me some years ago. He said, the Son of God didn't come so that we wouldn't have to suffer, but so that we could suffer well. And it just changed my whole approach to uh, the faith and toward life. And uh, that sounds like a good summary for the kinds of things that you're doing. Uh, I continue to be amazed at the stories you tell and uh, the world you're inhabiting, and I really appreciate, uh, as I know our listeners do, your sharing uh, as candidly as you do what it's like to go through that. And I know there's much more to talk about. Cindy, you mentioned hope. Uh, what does that look like in the midst of this? And that's a topic we ought to come to sometime. But for now... It is, it is one of the topics we'll talk on, I think. <laughs> um I, I think hope is another one of those things that without hope, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to make it through, to make it through whatever you happen to be going through. And I think that, you know, I've been at times when I've been in very dark places, Leonard's been a person who's told me, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but there are those moments when it seems like, um, it seems like there is no hope sometimes when we're going through. And I think each one of us has probably experienced that personally. There was a time where I lost my dad. Uh, my dad passed away right at the same time that a relationship ended that had been on and off for five years. And then I remember like just nine months after my dad had passed, Leonard was diagnosed with cancer for the first time. Leonard, who's been like a dad to me. And in that moment, it was very difficult to feel hopeful. But now looking back, the thing that's really crazy is during those times, I I didn't think I could continue with the work we were doing. At the time, our organization, our staff was much smaller. I was ready to give the whole thing up. And then I was on my way to Kenya trying to think of an exit strategy when Leonard was diagnosed with cancer. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't abandon Leonard in the midst of that. 
So I'm like, all right. So I, I almost felt like I was stuck. And sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I was ready to quit and I couldn't. It was just like stuck. And then, you know, a few months later, um, things started to grow and financially things were better. And I would never say Leonard got cancer to save Capenda, but those kinds of things kind of happened in a way. So it's kind of crazy to think about, you know, I mean, I think we're too small to think that these giant things would happen for those purposes, but I just know that those are the things that happened. And I think that one of the things I would, was able to tell someone after they had lost a close person to them, I'm like, even though it feels like the end of the world and that it can never get better, I can just tell you that I have felt that way before. And I didn't believe people when they told me it could be better, even if it's still going to be hard. And I think that those are the reminders too. Just, just, and it may not look the way you think it would. I think that we're changed people. We're not who we we were when before we started this. We're both we're good. Sometimes it's hard not to be cynical. I would say sometimes, having seen a lot of hard things, but I think that we can also we have a deeper understanding of of what can happen in this world. And I think it depends on how you define hope too. Um, I think that when we think the hope that everything will be fine, a definition of fine, all those things go in, it makes it difficult because everything bad could happen. We could lose everybody all at once. Those happens to people. But at the same time, to know that we can man, we can, we can survive things we might not have thought we could survive. And I think that's maybe hopeful. Well, there's plenty to talk about and mine on that topic uh, when we come back to that. Uh, for now, I, it's just kind of struck me that Christmas, is, you know, we have a whole genre of movies here, which are all syrupy and chirpy and cheerful. But the story is about this couple that are ostracized and a baby's born in a barn and soldiers are out to kill the baby. It's not the sweetest story in the world, uh, but it is a story of a co-sufferer. And maybe with that in mind, I wish both of you a very merry and meaningful Christmas until we meet again. Thank you both very much for these unlikely yeah. gifts. Thank you. Thank you so much. We hope this episode of An Unlikely Gift has been a source of hope to you as you walk through all of life's challenges and joys. If you'd like to be a part of the meaningful work Capenda is doing, please visit www.capenda.org. Capenda is K-U-P-E-N-D-A. And thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next week as we explore part two of the topic of suffering.